He watches his mother shoot his father three times in the back. I'm Mr. Blackwood, there the book is. Well, I look like Quasimodo to you. What about Johnny Lauer? What about China? Big speech of the deathbed. TNA Impact. Oh, they were on location for the Eight Mile Street fight. We had Leticia, AJ, Steiner, Christian, and Tomko. And Abyss. And Abyss. Christian and Tomko were having an argument. They just got back together last week and they're already having issues. Yay. They're talking, and in the background, AJ is holding up a sign. Abyss is growling, and Steiner, in his sunglasses, is randomly throwing things. <laughs> they have, like, 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 like street, uh, uh, street signs and, and, and guard. Uh, those orange things you see on the highway that you say, don't drive here. He, he was tossing the cones. No, thank you, the cones. Tossing cones around, and he would toss the cones. What's it like? Roman Earth, the lowest form of homie sapien there is. He's trying to save you there. I appreciate that. He tossed the cone, and it stopped, and flexed and stared at his arm. It was a, a great Scott Steiner moment. Then we had, oh, my eye. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm tired tonight. You're, you're done, aren't you? Oh, man. People don't understand how hard it is to talk for a extended oh, period I do. of time. Right on Tomco in a no DQ. Eight mile street fight. Eight mile street fight. That previous thing, by the way, was only good because of Scott Steiner. It, it was. They asked uh, Christian. It was actually Christian... Uh, was it? Tom Cole was going to be the street fight. And he said, are you guys going to have my back? And Christian said, of course we're going to have your back. Aren't we, you, aren't we Scotty? And Scotty responded by giving a thumbs up and then going back to throwing random objects. That's the only thing that saved us. The only thing. Th- th- this is great and miserable at the same time. It was great because of Scott Steiner. It was mis- miserable because, once again, we have a team of five guys who don't get along. Which is just like the other team, coincidentally. We'll get to that later. Rhino and Tom Co. no DQ, 8 Mile Street Fight. I just watched that match on ECW, and it was ten times better than this. Yeah. They brawled all over. It broke down into a wrestling match. And then Tom Co., who had just pinned Samo Joe a few weeks back and was the star of the show last week, he was gored by Rhino and pinned after Abyss accidentally hit him with a chair. And this, this was... I've seen far worse, don't it, get me wrong. This was there. It was a match. It was a match. The, uh, the, the, the thing to hate is that <laughs> why have Tomko lose? It didn't matter who won this. There was nothing at stake. You could have either guy win. For God's sake, if you're going to have Tomko be a star, have him beat fucking Rhino. No, they, everyone's got to be on Everyone's got to be equal. So then Angle ran in to attack Abyss, and then Joe followed him down so we can make sure that we had more baby faces than heels, which is always great to get some good heat. And then AJ and Christian ran down for the five-on-three advantage. And Steiner once again did the whole beatdown wearing his sunglasses. And again, saved the segment. He is great. This is the Scott Steiner show. It is. So, then the uh, show ended with all five guys standing victorious over the bodies of Team Angle. The segment ended with that. Not the whole show. We wish the show was over, but there's more. Thanks for ruining the joke there, dipshit. I'm turning you down. So then the show ended with all five of Team Christian standing there over the bodies of, of Team Angle, holding each other's arms up and celebrating. And uh, at that point I realized it was not, in fact, the end of the show. That was the opener. And there was uh, 45 more minutes to come after that giant angle right there. Then we had some geeks meeting with Cornette backstage. He freaked out, so everyone to shut up. He said he had a team meeting to worry about later. Ever needed to shut the fuck up and to hit the bricks and not come back without a written invite. And suddenly in ran Gail, who I guess had a written invite, and she attacked Jackie. And Chris Saban was standing there watching this, and he did not try to break this up. Instead, he started laughing and holding his Johnson. And finally, Geeks ran in to break it up, and every one of them copped a feel on the girls. And, and that was actually the story of this show, because it was not the only time this happened. We had Team Christian backstage. All five were behaving in a manner that real human beings do not behave, but that's actually what makes these five great. 
I'm not going to check your ID. Drink it. Come on. Sip it. Come on. Come on. Boys. Boys, listen up. Listen up. I'd like to propose a toast to Team Cage. You know, I'm going to go out on a ledge here and I'm just going to say it. We've already won at lockdown. That's what I call an unstoppable unit. Right, Scotty? Right, Scotty? Right. You remember Hero G? Remember when the Pearl Harbor brought the Germans? We went to DJ Oliver again, baby. The scary, thing, scary thing is, he's not even drunk yet. Oh, you know, yeah, I got a better idea. Let's turn this party up a notch, huh? I know a good club down the street, and you know what? They love me there. They love me everywhere. Let's go down there and party like it's 1999. Everybody, everybody except for a bitch. You almost got Tonko killed tonight. You almost ruined the whole plan. So you know what? We're going to go out and party until you learn how to be a real team player. Until then, we can stay here and clean up this crap. Let's go, boys. You heard him. Get up and clean this mess up. Now. Well, okay. Well, if you'd like me to call Mother Abyss, I can do that. I suggest you have this dump immaculate before I get back. Or else. They were all screaming and doing this, and then Steiner screamed, and I quote, Hey, remember Hirojima... And remember when the Pearl Harbor bombed the Germans? Well, it's D-Day all over again. Woo! I don't know what that means. He was very passionate. And then Christian said, We're all going to go party at this club down the street. And I should note, by the way, that Tonka was back there celebrating, even though he'd lost in the opener. He did not give a shit about losing. So they said everyone was going to party except Abyss. He had to stay and clean up. And Abyss was violently angry that he did not get to go and party at the club. Which made me sad because the idea of skits with Abyss in the dance club, molesting girls, that to me, that's a skit. That's a skit right there. I'm going to take you off probation. But Why is that? How about you shut the fuck up and stop ruining jokes? Well, I didn't realize you were making a joke. I thought you were just being stupid. Well, can I at least finish before you point out stupidity to make sure there's nothing more? I will, in the future, try to remember to not interrupt you when you're being stupid. Jesus Christ. You know, you're a horrible host. Yes. Let me tell you why. Because when I want you to talk, you don't. And when I'm actually trying to talk, you just jump in. Well, here's the thing. We need a balance here. The, the, the reason you want me to talk is because you have nothing to say about the subject. The reason you have nothing to say about the subject is there's nothing to say. Therefore, you say what? That's that's what I have noticed. Because the the, the the reason you only want me to talk when you have nothing to say about whatever we're talking about. No, I give my thoughts and then I pause so I can hear your thoughts. I see. And instead, I usually pause and you go, "Yep, good segment." And then when I'm in the middle of giving my thoughts or telling a funny joke, you're like, wait a second, it wasn't the end of the show. There's 45 minutes to come. That was a funny joke? It's, it would have been. You ruined it. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to ruin your funny joke. My bad. I'm trying to fucking give you the office. Okay, I, I, I grant that I often have just nothing to say about this bullshit. I fully admit that. I, uh, some of the stuff is not worthy of comment, frankly. Make something up, then. And I will also grant that when I do a thing to say, I get so excited about the fact that I have something to say that I speak in at rude moments. You can't just hold on for, like, five seconds. I, 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 I should. I'm, well, I, let's I, practice I tonight. I will try to do better. Let's at, practice. I will try to do better at making up bullshit instead of not saying anything and, and withholding my valid points when I do have something to say. It just withhold them for two seconds so I can finish my thought. I'm not saying withhold them till next week. I'm saying wait ten seconds. Because I guarantee there's going to be a moment when I stop talking. <laughs> well, and give you the office. I, see. I still think we need to go to the, the, with the, uh, the sign theory. You hold up a sign that says speak. And that's when I go. I thought, I, you know, I figured just looking at you and stopping <laughs> talking would be a signal to go. And apparently that's just not enough. No, it doesn't work that way. God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. We need to have a webcam. Just people watch you perform. I just, I sit here and I stare at you and I, I close my mouth. And I like sit back away from the mic. And you're like, what's he doing that for? Hmm. 
I'll just sit here quietly. Well, those are the times when I have nothing to say. And then I start telling the joke, and you're like, wait a second, the chickens can't cross the road. They're in the pen. If I were going to say, why did the chicken cross the road? You'd cut in. I would. Oh, boy. VKM and LAX. For some reason, Christy came out to give them a piece of her mind. Or a piece of their mind. But that would suspect. Anyway. So Lance Hoyt picked her up by the ass and carried her backstage. And uh, then we had. Let's see. What did we have? Oh, VKM and LAX. They had a match. And it was a. Uh, it was fine. The Latino Nation inexplicably hit the ring for the DQ. And then Team 3 ran down to make the save, and Bubba cut a promo saying that they accepted LAX's challenge for the pay-per-view. It will be an electrified cage match for the uh, NWA Tag Team <clears throat> titles. And uh, fans were really into this. It was a uh, it was a fine little, little promo, and I guess people buy the pay-per-view, but I don't know. What is an electrified cage? It's apparently it's the cage, and they will just plug it in. What is that? What, how, do you, how do you prove it's electrified? Does the ref touch and go, oh? I, I would imagine there'll be hokey spark special effects. It'll be cheesy like Ned Wood production. Well, what happens if somebody hits the button when the girls are in there or something like that? Well, they won't be plugged in when the other matches are going on. Oh, I, I, oh the I, plug. I want to see a scene where they take an extension cord out from, my, from the back, if you go all the way down the ramp, and plug it into the cage. And that electrifies the entire cage. That electrifies the cage, yeah. That's what I want to see happen. Boy, that's going to be one hot fence right there. One extension cord? Sure. Okay. I don't know. I don't know how it works. Anyway, that's the match. Then we had Borash interviewing Angle. Joe was screaming at him. He said he still hated him. I thought they were friends. I've long since given up. He said the reason he signed for this deal was because, um, what did Tony say here? Tony just PM'd me. <laughs> I'm watching the Pride pay-per-view in 15 minutes. <laughs> Tell him have fun. <laughs> We won't. <laughs> Tony, as has been noted, is a complete MMA geek who will do things like watch the the the, the, the foreign broadcast of pay per views over the internet in a in a two and a half inch window and enjoy it. Um, dumb ass, you can actually get it on pay per view in fifteen minutes. Oh well, okay. Yes, he he's doing that, but he's done the other thing before too. Come on over, we will be up till six. Six o'clock. They have a six. Our window. All right, anyway, while we're doing this, huh, let's do this PM conversation. Five hours. Mm. There's a five-hour window. Jesus. How much for that? This is life at Figure 4 headquarters This is here. what Brian's every day is like this. It is. Just windows popping up all over. $40 for five hours? We're... Not watching all five hours tomorrow, I hope. So how are they going to do? Are they going to edit it? I, you're asking me? So is tomorrow's show edited to three? I don't know. I think he's thinking we're going to watch a five-hour pay-per-view tomorrow. He's free <laughs> to think that if he wants. <laughs> Show is five hours. That's a lot of exclamation points and question marks right there. All right, so uh, I'm telling. The fuck, were we talking about? Oh, we're not ready. Not ready to go back yet. We're doing the show, by the way. This is on the air, so he knows. Uh, yeah. So uh, they were all arguing back and forth, and basically, Angle said, "Listen." Sting and Abyss were supposed to be our partners, but Abyss is a madman, and Sting won't return my calls. And he said, uh, next week we will have five men. So I guess, uh, for those who don't know who the fifth man is, it's uh, Jeff Jarrett. So, okay. there you he go. He's going to be the big, the mysterious hero to come and save the day. Yeah. Woo! Austin Starr and Senshi in a submission match. This was the best match they had an impact in a long time. They just gave them time to have a match. They went all the way through commercial. Everything was going great. They were working real hard. Things were great. And then all of a sudden, since she got locked in a hold, and Bob Backlund didn't want him to see him hurt, so he just went in and threw in the towel. 
This is, of course, a, a callback to the most famous match of Bob Backlund's career, which no one watching had a clue about. Can anyone just do a job? <laughs> That's what I want to know. So anyway, then we had a pre-taped interview with Tanae and Sting. During this interview, scary music played. Well, scary and then sad music. This has got to stop. <laughs> Either way. It ruins these segments. It makes them bad, bad comedy. Sting in all the years that I've been I've never seen you commit to a project like you did with Abyss. Then two weeks ago, he turns his back on you. Last week, we hear this incredible story from James Mitchell about Abyss's past. Have you had the opportunity to, to digest this information? Well, first of all, I, let me just take this chance right now to apologize to Abyss. Chris, man, I, I just... I want to tell you that I'm sorry. I'm, I'm truly sorry. I had no idea things would turn out like this. and I thought that by dealing with your past, it would set you free. But, oh man, I had no idea that it would further imprison you. Sting, it, it sounds to me like you've given up. Do you, do you think this is the way I envision things? I mean, I, you know what? I, I came back at Bound for Glory. One month, I'm on top of the world. And then... Six months later, I mean, man, for the first time, it's all just like slipping through my fingers. You think this was my dream? I mean, you think this is the way I wanted to go out after two decades? Where do you go from here? All I know is I got to go home, look at my wife in the eyes, look at my children in the eyes. Look at myself in the eyes and know that I failed. Who in 2007 would possibly think that playing these, this music during these skits is a good idea? I don't know. Community management is the only, the only answer I have for you. Because I can't imagine anyone thinking, you know, this. I wouldn't care about this interview, but the sad music makes me sit up and pay attention. I, I really feel Sting's pain here. Sting said he had to act. I want to apologize to Chris. I had no idea things were this bad. I thought that if Abyss just faced his past, things would turn out for the best. But instead, it just further imprisoned him. And so Tanae said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to look my wife in the eyes. I'm going to look my children in the eyes. I'm going to look at myself in the eyes. And no, I failed. And it just cut to black. Immediately. I was like, huh, that sucked. This was also people acting like no one in the real world, real world actually does. But this time it was not great. No. This time it was horrible. Keep that in mind, by the way. Cornette had the mandatory meeting, read the lockdown card. We've got a five-man escape the cage match with Saban, Dutt, Lethal, Shelly, and Shark Boy, where the winner gets the X Division title. Robert Roode versus Petey Williams. Jerry Lynn versus Chris Daniels, who no-showed the meeting. Cornette made very clear. Senshi versus Austin Starr with Bob Backlund as the referee. Chris Harris versus James Storm in a blindfold match in a steel cage. Yeah. Gail Kim versus Jacqueline in a ladies' match in a steel cage. LAX versus Team 3 in an electrified cage. And lethal lockdown with Angle and Team Cage. I'd like to note that, again, we've got matches that probably could be pretty goddamn good without a stupid stipulation, such as Senshi and Austin Starr with Bob Backlund as the referee. Just let the him fucking wrestle. two cowboys in a blindfold <laughs> match. Let's handicap everybody and, and try and... I don't know. So anyway, Cornette said... Angle were your partners, and, and Angle said, I'll have them all next week, blah, blah, blah. Christian grabbed the mic, cut a promo. They were about to brawl when the lights went out, and who should appear to make the save for Kurt Angle's team but Sting? He was back. Fifteen minutes, <laughs> less, ten minutes, after deciding he was going to go home and look at himself in the mirror, he was back. I, 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 I am looking at you. I am now pointing at you. You have not yet leaned back in your chair. This was stupid. That's all I gotta say. See, okay, th this. Can you wrap the sh that wrap up? Well, what annoyed me about this segment is different from what annoyed you. And the fascinating thing okay, was back. Okay, we'll go. I am numb to the fact that Sting was back. 
What annoyed me the most was you already have the lethal lockdown ruined because both teams can't get along. Both teams all hate each other. And then Cornette makes an announcement, and he, he delivered, he, he said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but this is close, to give the NWA title some prestige and credibility for a change. The winner of this match, whoever gets the pin for either team, will get a title shot. So now you have the two, the, the two teams of guys who disagree. Now they're competing with each other. Now they're competing with their own teammates. Meanwhile, poor Christian. He has absolutely nothing to gain in this match. He can only get hurt. Well, he can get the pin, and then presumably he has no challenger for the next show. That's a horrible idea. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's not, he's not totally hopeless. I, I guess, but th- this is just, th- this, that's what annoyed me. I didn't care about Sting being back. I cared about the stupidity of, of taking the team match and making it a, a, a sloppy bunch of individuals in a battle royal in a cage. Let me ask you a serious question. Okay. I recapped that segment, and then I looked at you for an extended period of time and made no noise. And you didn't speak. You, you actually gestured, I've got nothing to say. Then I pointed my hand at you to further give you the office. You're very annoyed right now. And you said, I've got nothing to say. And you haven't leaned back in your chair. So then I leaned back into the chair, and I pointed at you, and you said, I've got nothing to say. And so I said, well, why don't you just wrap up the segment? And then all of a sudden you exploded into a ten-minute tirade that was great. Why couldn't you have done that when I first looked at you? Because I'm not good at segues. We were talking about different things here. You were talking about... I had nothing to say about Sting being back. We don't need segues on this show. I see. When I give you the office, talk about bowling or something. (laughs) Just say something. Just speak. So we don't have this moment of awkward silence where I'm looking at you and pointing and waiting for you to just say anything that has anything to do with wrestling. (laughs) Why don't we do this then? I'll, I'll, I'll take a few notes tomorrow about thoughts I have throughout the day. Sure. I'll bring it up come compare. And whenever you give me the office, I will look down on my notepad and, and rant about whatever's written down. Let me ask this question, though. There wasn't a segue, so were you just going to hold that thought until I wrap the show up and then I felt, announce it tomorrow? Honestly, yes. I, I felt that I had a responsibility as co-host, co-host of the show to say something about Steam being back. And when I had nothing to say, that frustrated me. <laughs> so you couldn't just say... I have no problem seeing him bring him back, but, which is actually what you said. That is out of my means. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I suck at radio. Well, I'm trying to improve it I, I realize you are. Oh, my God, everybody. What a show this has been. TNA is this coming Sunday, so I guess we might as well talk about that damn show. Everybody's favorite program. <laughs> Conan promised a huge surprise for Team 3D tonight, I'll say. We had Angle, Sting, Rhino, and Joe in the ring. Sting apologized for not returning Angle's call, saying he had a lot of, stu- uh, a lot of stuff to deal with, but those issues were now settled. God put him on Earth to be a pro wrestler, and he loved TNA. <laughs> He's the one. He's the one. He said he wanted to know who the fifth man was. Angle said, listen, blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you who it is later. Joe got mad, ran him down. Kurt said, listen, don't question my integrity. At which point everyone went, <gasps> and he said, I swear on the U.S. flag, the fifth member will be revealed before the end of the night. Yeah. Okay. By the way, I figured out a problem with this show that needs to be addressed immediately. It sucks. No, seriously. Is there a new one? <laughs> the, the problem with this show is... Mike Tanay and Don West need to just shut up. We, we have noticed this before. Okay. But this is a bad example. Listen, or, I, I don't know. I, I think Jim Ross in an interview once made the comment that sometimes it's okay to not say anything. Sometimes it's okay to just shut up. Joe was in there, and he pretty much said, I don't trust you, Kurt. At which point Mike Tanay screams, Joe's saying he doesn't trust Kurt. <laughs> I was like, no shit. Will you shut the fuck up so I can hear what, the, the rest of what he's saying here? You, you're, you just, you told me what he just said. <laughs> you're just repeating what's in, going on in the ring. You're narrating a promo. That annoyed me. This is, that, that was the, a, a particularly bad example of what they do, but they do this all the time. Most promos, when the guy stops to inhale 
Mike's name and Don West will spit out whatever line they have written down, which is supposed to be funny or, or, or in, in, in enticing or, or, or exciting or something, and it's just dumb. They did in the fantastic later, though, which we'll get into. <clears throat> Chris Saban and Jay Lethal in a non-title match. Lethal is now Black Machismo. He's doing the Randy Savage gimmick. He has the tights, the fringe jacket, the boots, the sunglasses, the cowboy hat, the mannerisms, the whole nine yards. The hair. More so, he now wrestles like Randy Savage. He does all of his moves, mm -hmm. Nick snap over the top rope, blah, yep. blah, blah. And the fascinating thing to me is when he works a match like Randy Savage, who is one of the great workers in the history of WWE, when he works a match like Randy Savage, the people are so much more into it than they are when he works like Jay Lethal. Hmm. How could that be? I, I don't know. Perhaps working a simple <laughs> old school style where you uh, shine, you have the heat, and then you have a comeback, may work. I could be wrong here. I will say that, that everything he did, all of his mannerisms, everything was awesome, except what a shitty flying elbow. That one needs some practice. That's like uh, the, the one, the most important move is the one he can't do. Of course, there, it, there's still time. I've never seen anybody do a, a flying elbow like Randy Savage. Maybe it's just because I grew up as a huge Randy Savage fan, but I've never... Shawn Michaels, I was always like, you're no Randy Savage. Yeah. Your flying elbow is no good. He was very cool. Randy Savage was awesome. People don't... People talk about the great wrestlers of the 80s. His name doesn't often come up. I think it's because... Well, he had bad days. He had bad days, and, and also, at the time, and especially later, he became a total cartoon character. <laughs> yes. People like overlooked what he could do as far as being a wrestler because he was... So wacky, and he was wacky then. I mean, even people from the 80s, all they do is do his promos and the oh yeah and stuff, but god damn, he was great. Yeah, he was awesome. At the end, when his, his hip was bad, he, he would uh, do those flying elbows and kill men. Well, then he, was, he would actually do flying he elbows. He was less it. awesome then. Yeah, but he was, still, he was still very good. So then we had the announcers running down the card, and, and uh, I mentioned this also on The Daily Show today, but when they ran down this card, I thought... All right, there's three matches I give even one fuck about. The rest I don't give two fucks about, for those of you doing the math. But the three matches were Harrison Storm, which, which actually I take off the list because of the blindfold stipulations. Okay. If this were just a straight match, I'd be interested in seeing it. Not worth paying 30 bucks for, but I'd be interested in seeing that match. The Chicks. I ain't paying 30 bucks for them, but that match has me interested. And the third match is uh, Team 3D and LAX. Wouldn't pay 30 bucks, but I'm interested in that match. And I noticed that the, the, the common thread among all three matches were the storyline's simple. It's two, uh, either two people or two groups of people that hate each other. That is the common thread, yes. And that's, that's, that's it. You, you, you spend a month making it very clear why everybody hates each other. You you take a month and, and have a pull-apart, maybe, here or there. You take a month and, and have each man explain, or woman in this case, why they don't like each other. And then you say, on this date, they'll all be fighting. And it doesn't matter if it's a real fight or a fake fight. That's what people want to see. People want to see. That's, that's like saying, well, you know, Brian, the whole real fake thing. It's like, Brian, I only watch documentaries. I don't watch films. They're fake. Okay, I guarantee that the the biggest documentary of all time still made a, a smidgen of the money Titanic made. It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. People want to see a confrontation, whether it's real or fake. And those are the three matches on the show that that I actually am interested in because of that very there's, reason. There's, there's option A and there's option B. And they hate each other. And they hate each other. And as opposed to the main event was option A, who also hates option A. Yeah. And option B, who hates option B. And the then main event is so convoluted. And, and it's like, oh, everybody hates each other. And, and it's a mystery. And, oh, by the way, I, I, well, we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, all this other wacky bull. Someone's mom. All this other shit. <laughs> why? why who, who could care? I don't know. Except Seber. There is Seber. He's gone. That's sad. I think he's gone. I remember when he said he wasn't a DNA fan? Yeah, that was funny. And that's all he ever talked about? Yeah. 
All right, so we got uh, more with Nash and Lethal. Sanjay Dutt is now playing Vinny Vegas. It's wacky. This was great just because it was Sanjay Dutt, and it was actually Kevin Nash's Vinny Vegas jacket. It came down to his knees. Yeah. It was like a kid playing dress-up. Wow, what a win for Jay Lethal as he heads back. What? Cheese Do you trust me now? I trust you, but uh, we're both Sanjay. Work in progress. Hey, Ben Man, come here. Ben Man? Look at that, huh? Nice. Oh, Say it. Vinny Vegas. Vegas? Come on. Say it. Forget about it. Wow. Money, huh? Money, huh? No, no, I don't want to do that. Come on, one more time. One more time. Let me, let me hear it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Okay? I'm done. Ah, man. Hey, listen, I can work on this. Work in progress, apparently. So, Eric? Eric! And Borash! Man, you are as stupid as you look. What did I tell you last time? You don't talk to Eric Young unless you get Robert Roode's permission first. Do you understand anything? Listen, since you're here, get that microphone up nice and tight. Because Petey Williams, as far as I'm concerned, locked down, can start ah, to down! Blindfold match! <laughs> this hair's getting better get used to having two blindfolds on, you know what I'm talking about? Petey Williams, you want to be a friend to Eric Young, that's fine! Because you won't be a friend for long, because this Sunday night, I'm going to prove to you that it does pay to be rude. Jackie? Are you ready for this mixed tag match? Better, better, better. Ready to give Gail Kim just a little taste of what's going to happen on her Sunday yeah, night? Yeah. Let's do it! Let's do it! Eric? I want you to sit in that chair, and I don't want you to move. Do you understand me? Sit there and don't move. Don't move. Stay right there. P. Williams and Gail Kim versus James Storm and Jackie. Gail Kim looked quite good this evening. Uh, Robert Roode took out Gail with a back suplex. She was out for most of the match. And, and of course, she, uh, I believe, yeah, she broke free and ran back. And then uh, blah, blah, blah. I, I recap these matches and I have to read it word for word because I don't remember a fucking thing that happened. Yeah. But uh, the only match I remember from the show, I guess I remember the main event now, but I, I remember the, the the lethal match being good. Yeah, because he was Randy Savage. <laughs> he was Randy Savage. So Chris Harris made the uh, save afterwards and, and shit happened and, and I don't care. All I know is blindfolds suck. There was shit involving Cowboys and Robert Roode and Eric Young and, and, and Don't Fire Eric and Chicks and yeah. Morash tried to interview Daniels but couldn't get an answer out of him. And then up walked LAX with Spike, or Runt. He was bound and gagged. Conan had a pistola on his belt, a firearm. Took him down to the ring and, and uh, said that they were going to shoot him. This amused me. It was a taser. They were going to mur- Not only were they going to murder this guy, I thought, they were going to murder him in the middle of the ring on the show. <laughs> yeah. There may be evidence for this. Nobody called the cops during the break. No, no, no. No, nothing like that. So Bubba came out and, and commanded them, and I quote, Do not shoot our brother. Do not shoot our brother. So Conan proceeded to shoot the brother, and that was that. The announcers were appalled. They came back from commercial, and today was <laughs> just a new level of Mike Tanay. Well, we should point out that we missed the show. Conan held the gun aloft. It's a black pistol-shaped object, and I thought to myself, he's got a gun. And Mike Tanay says, he's got a taser gun. <laughs> so Mike Tanay apparently is far more uh, knowledgeable of personal defense devices than I am, but I thought, okay. He lives in Vegas. Yeah. He usually lives in Vegas. And at that point, I'm thinking, if I'm Bubba, I would think, just a taser, go ahead. <laughs> you know, Bubba was appalled. Yeah. So anyway... They freaked out, and, and everybody just needs to get a tape just to watch Tanae and, and Don West freak out about this, because it was, it, was, it was one of those things that was so fucking hilarious, and that was not the intention at all. I mean, we were all supposed to be at home appalled. Instead, we were all at home laughing. Yes. Laughing hilariously at these, uh, uproariously is a better word. If they had actually shot him with a pistol with bullets... I don't think Mike Tanae and Don West could have been any more serious. No, they, they were just, just it, it, this was too much. My God, I can't believe what we've just witnessed. Conan, LAX, you crossed the line. This time you went way too far. It's, it's the sight there of Brother Run twitching on the ground after Conan shot the, the taser gun inside him there. And then, of course, Brother Ray, Brother D-Mod getting all the security in there and getting him out. It was the most disturbing thing I think I've ever seen here at TNA. So then we had the main event, which was Samoa Joe and AJ Styles. The winner of this match, their team got the advantage at War Games. AJ has new music. It sucks. It sucks, and it has, still has the same shitty lyrics. He did, he did a shoot back rake, which... Please explain that to me. <laughs> the whole point of the move, at least in 2007, is it's silly. I mean, when we saw Raven and Disco do that awesome comedy match, 
Raven announced, I am now going to do a back rake. <laughs> and he placed his hands on Disco's back and raked him down, and Disco screamed, and everyone laughed, and it was great. Yeah. AJ Styles with Samoa Joe dug his apparently sharpened nails into his flesh yeah. and tore not just down, like at an angle. Yes. Like he was trying to do liposuction. Yes. And Samoa Joe had scratch marks, he blood. He was bleeding. Yes. From a back rake. I don't get it, but maybe it's just me. Other than that, everything was fine. So we had a ref bump. Actually, I gotta explain this exactly because I'm gonna really, I'm not, I'm not gonna rant. Enjoy. But... All right, here we go. Joe's making a comeback. He goes for a kick off the top, but AJ pulled the referee in front, so the referee took a bump. So Joe put him in the choke. Christian tap. No ref. So out came both teams to brawl. In the melee, Jarrett's music hit. He came down with his guitar, held up five fingers, hit uh, AJ with the guitar. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, AJ. Joe got the pin. And, Christian s- tapped, that was AJ. And so, uh, whatever. So, uh, Joe got the pin, and uh, don't interrupt me, by the way. Just let me fuck up on my own. So, uh, held up the fingers, clobbered AJ, Joe got the pin. So now, apparently, the the good guys have the advantage in war games. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, Brian, why would you have the good guys have the advantage in the war games? Because that means they're always at a uh, numbers advantage against the bad guys, and thus they're not really good guys. They're they're uh, this is bad psychology. There's a reason that every single war game in the history of man has had the heels have the numbers advantage. Well, there's a young man booking by the name of Vince Russo. And he's like, well, it's never been done before. We've got to give the baby faces the advantage in war games. And everybody else is like, no. There's a reason for that. This is stupid. This is Jeff Jarrett's big baby face return, and he's going to go in there with a, with a numbers advantage. He ain't going to get... This is not going to get nearly the reaction it would get if he was outnumbered. So Russo got very, very upset, and, and, and this, that, and the other thing. And Anyway, this, this is the, um, this is the uh, compromise. As of this show, the baby faces have the numbers advantage. But what they're going to do is they're going to go on the Internet. They're going to no. go on TNAWrestling.com and have Jim Cornette announce, apparently, that the... Uh, the because of the the interference by the baby faces because the baby faces cheated. I'm not making this up. <laughs> because the baby faces cheated, the heels now have the advantage. Now, awesome. Now, as stupid as that is, they are so stupid <laughs> that they didn't think to not have AJ Styles pull the ref in front of him. So really. The heels were the ones that cheated first, but still, because I guess the... Uh, I am so confused right now. Baby faces cheated to actually get the pinfall in the end, because their cheating immediately led to a finish. They're the ones that are no longer going to have the numbers advantage. Why would anyone watch this show? I'm just telling you what's happening. <laughs> I'm asking a question. I don't have an answer for you. So anyway... So the show went off the air... Jarrett's at the top of the ramp. He's holding the remnants of his guitar and holding five fingers, saying, I am number five. All the baby faces in the ring pissed off. <laughs> Which, I guess in storyline makes sense, but Jesus Christ, the show is in two days. Three days from when this was on TV. But you want to see the teams as a unit. You want to see them all standing together, fighting for a common goal. Now they all hate each other. Dumb. Everybody, everybody <laughs> hates each other. And even for Jarrett's big return. Forget what you think about Jarrett. Forget if, if you, 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 you hate him, you love him. You think, okay, Jeff Jarrett's returning to the company for the first time in months. It should be a big deal. So there's 8,000 men in the ring. It's like watching 300 again. There's just men flying everywhere and fighting. Jarrett's music hits. The crowd reacts a little bit. The announcers don't react at all. Like, they didn't hear it. And I'm like, did, did someone hit the cue early? Is this song not supposed to play now? And then suddenly Jarrett's in the ring. <laughs> he just shows up. There's a blonde guy with a guitar. And he holds up five, he whacks he, he, he The crowd did go nuts. So by that point, they figured out everything worked. But I thought, my God, your return was lame. <laughs> that was his big return. And he cheated. So they are going to lose their advantage in war games, which I guess means everybody's going to be even madder at each other. So welcome to TNA, everybody. Welcome to TNA. 30,000 buys. You'll wonder why. Actually, I do. I wonder why it's that high. <laughs> Uh, we 
watched the TNA show, and I'd heard things about the blindfold match. And I had gotten word that there were two worst match of the year contenders. And after the blindfold match, I thought, what could possibly give this one a run for its money? And then we saw the electrified cage. This <laughs> show sucked ten cocks. hate to uh, use such terminology, but it was pretty bad. And then, I don't know. It started out, it started out so promising. And then it just fell right off a cliff. They were not in St. Louis. They were near St. Louis. There was about 5,000 fans in the building. And they were hot. It was like the first match started, and it was like, holy shit, we're watching a TNA show here in front of 5,000 rabid fans in St. Louis or near St. Louis. or They just called it St. Louis, so we'll call it St. Louis. All these 5,000 fans, and they're having so much fun. And boy, did TNA just kill those fucking fans dead. By the end of this show, Buddy said they killed the town. They'll never be back. He may very well be right. This was some dumb shit. And we'll get into it as we uh, get on here. Vinny? I said at one point they killed the city. And Buddy said, he said a lot of stuff at one point, so knock it off. Go on. And you yell at me for interrupting. I don't need any sexual comments about TNA on this show, young man. Go on. I said they killed the city. <laughs> and Buddy said, yeah, they'll never have wrestling there again. And I said, no, I don't mean for wrestling. I mean for humanity. I see. So all the people are going to leave. Well, there was an escape the cage match where the rules number three was leave St. Louis. You had to escape the cage and apparently leave the town in order to win. And we never saw the winner leave the town, but I presume he did because God knows that's how you had to win this match. It was uh, Jay. And by the way, this was uh, the lockdown pay per view. It was supposed to be six sides of steel, but instead it was six sides of cable. Like the cable that you would make ropes out of. They they constructed some sort of, I don't even know what. A you, web? A net? Kind of like that old game where you put the uh, chips down the thing. Connect four? Connect four. It was like a giant connect four made out of cables on all all the sides. And, and it didn't look very dangerous at all. You, you, you threw somebody in a wire or into a cable and they were supposed to gig. It didn't have the, the loud sound of, of crashing into a cage or whatever, and and uh, we'll just get into the stupidity of this, this cage match deal a little bit later on. But um, anyway, the first match was Escape the Cage. Jay Lethal, Chris Sabin, Sanjay Dutt, Sharkboy, and Alex Shelley. Of course, it's TNA, so it can't just be the winner is the champion. This is for the X title. It has to be... Okay, it's an elimination match. When it comes down to two men, it's Escape the Cage rules. And God knows if they informed the fans of this, because you would, you would think not, based on their reactions. started out great. Fans were into it. Guys were going crazy. Everything was cool. Shelly and Saban were a great team. So great that I had WCW flashbacks and presumed that at TV, they will be broken up and be feuding together. And it came down to Saban, Shelly, Machismo, and Dutt. The crowd completely died. Sanjay made his comeback, and, and no one cared. And it was not his best night. And Machismo pinned Shelly with his Randy Savage flying elbow, which looked no better than on Thursday. And it came down to, who did it come down to? Lethal and um, Saban. Saban. They climbed over the top, and they did this stupid spot where you're both outside the cage over the ground, and you start hitting each other. And I always think, why would you do that? Because if you hit the guy and you win the fist fight, you win because he falls down, and if he falls down, he wins the match. So why the fuck would you hit him? So they're brawling and brawling and brawling, and, and finally Saban kicks his leg into the mesh or whatever, so he's stuck. And then Chris Saban dropped down and won, and, and Black Machismo was left hanging around like a total nerd. And it was, you know, it was a probably two and three quarter star match. They tried very, very hard, but uh, it was one of those matches where... You know, no one saved anything for the end. It was everything at the beginning. So by the end, no one gave a shit. It's like you, you start with, with uh, Hurricane Ranas and dives and flying, and then it ends when you're both sitting there on the side of the cage hitting each other. And you wonder why nobody cared. So that was that match. This was one, and I know the answer to this question, so don't feel the need to, to, to give it. But I, I, I asked the question, why not just do a tag team match? Because this is TNA. And they have to get everyone on the show. Saban and Shelley, I understand they've been teaming in Ring of Honor lately and other indie feds, and, and you were right. They were a fine team. They, all, all their double teams looked good. They, they, they worked great together. Everything was going 
fantastic. And <laughs> the, the Macho Man thing, I, I think, I don't think it's going to last long. I think the novelty is going to wear off. Why? I, I'm fine with it. He's a better worker as Randy Savage than he is as Jay Lethal, so I got no problem oh, with that. I hope you're right. But I, I just imagine someone, I, I don't know if anyone, I, I doubt anyone bought this, and, and this is their first exposure to TNA, but watching that and saying, hey, it's a Macho Man ripoff. And it's just weird. There was an interview segment that he did with Letitia, and I just watched it, and I thought, does she even know who Randy Savage is? Yeah. I'll bet the answer is no. And and I should also know that Buddy Wayne came over for this pay-per-view, so we can talk to him about it on Thursday on the show. But the point was, he, he's not a big follower of TNA, so we had to explain everything to Buddy Wayne. And boy... Trying to explain these angles to, to a guy that doesn't watch TNA was, was quite the task. He had no idea what was going on, nor did he care. And it was impossible to make him care about some of this bullshit. So, We also had to explain to him this woman had a job as an interviewer with TNA. She was not like on her way to the mall and stopped in in her T-shirt and jeans and hoop earrings. She wasn't even in jeans. She was like in a word, just like black tights, like she just got back from yoga. <laughs> Borash was interviewing Team Christian, who... First, they were happy because Cornette had reversed the decision from Thursday because the bad guys had cheated, or the good guys had cheated, even though the bad guys cheated first. You know? We course, discussed that one already. Of course you don't. So then the uh, then they were all mad at each other because they were arguing about the title shot, and it, there was ranting and raving and screaming, and it was just mind-numbing, a complete mess. This was bullshit. Robert Roode and, and Petey Williams, they had Tracy Brooks... And Eric Young out there. Eric Young, of course, against his will. And, again, I ask the question. Why is Robert Roode holding Eric Young hostage? Answer this question for me, please. Because you would think if he hates because him. Because he wants to be popular? Well, his plan's backfiring. How, how? Okay. If Eric Young's plan is to employ Eric Young so that, Eric, so that Robert Roode will be popular with the fans... How is he looking to put this plan into action? That's my question. Because there doesn't seem to be any plan of action. He drags the man down a ringside. He berates him. Nobody cares. They still boo him. Where are you going from here, Robert Roode? Well, of course, there's no answer because this is TNA. Why can't Eric Young just quit? Well, because then he won't be allowed to wrestle again. Why? Why will he be out of the wrestling business if if Robert Roode fires him from his wacky group? Is 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 Robert Roode an employee at Panda? Why? I believe the the, the answer is because. <laughs> I I I hate this more than Abyss and his mom and dad and the gun. That's actually perfectly. I, I really I don't blame you at all. Because at least at least I can explain to myself that. The Abyss storyline makes sense because no one watches TNA, right. including the authorities. Including the law. I'm the only person that watches this show and the people on our website, and none of them are in law enforcement, and if they are like Carl Stern, they don't give a shit. It's out of their jurisdiction. That is how I justify the Abyss storyline. This storyline, I can't justify in any way. You cannot. You in can't no close way, the logicals. In no way can I make any sort of logical explanation for anything that's going on in this stupid fucking storyline. So they're out there and they have this match, and and uh, you know they they did a match with Robert Roode and Pete Williams. I should probably mention that, and and it was you know a fine little by the numbers match, and and so anyway, Tracy tried to hand Roode a hockey stick, but Young confiscated it. So uh, the best part of this was. Rude wanted the stick when he was in control. And I was like, why do you need the stick then? You're beating the shit out of the man. Why do you need control? Mm -hmm. what, do you need the, what do you need the stick for when you're in control? So uh, Eric Young grabs the stick from him and, and shoves down the girl. And, and then uh, he goes to hand the stick to uh, Petey Williams. So Petey used it and hit Rude twice right in front of the ref, which was not a DQ. But then the third time, the ref took it and threw it out of the ring. So apparently there's, like, the, the rules of TNA changed by the moment. It was okay to use the stick twice, but on the third time, that wasn't allowed. So after the baby face had hit this heel with the stick two times and not gotten the pin, uh, the heel pinned him uh, clean. He just 
He uh, P went, a move. P went for the uh, Canadian Destroyer, and then uh, Rude just escaped and hit a fisherman suplex and right. pinned him clean. Mm-hmm. That was it. That was the end of the match. Everything about this, I, I will give credit to P. Williams and, and Robert Rude because they worked very hard. And Robert Rude actually looked really good. But yeah. aside from that, just utter bullshit. I mean, just two guys put in just the stupidest fucking situation, the stupidest storyline, the stupidest booking, and and it's a story of TNA. Take what could be a good match and make it bad. Make the guys have to fight to have it not be bad. That was the story of, of, of this show especially, but in, in TNA in general. And I guess the good news for Petey is that he's lost his feud, so maybe he's out of the feud now. Maybe maybe he'll move on to something else. God, Robert Roode is stuck with a shitty gimmick. Yes. That poor fucker. So Angle had to go meet with everybody backstage and explain that Cornette had reversed the decision because of Jarrett's interference. And and Rhino said he could forgive and forget, but Angle better go tell Joe. Gail Kim and Jackie, once again, they worked hard. It, the best part is it was escape the cage, but they were, like, both brawling outside the cage before the match. I was like, okay, so whoever jumps in first, do they just lose? <laughs> that would make sense if you think about it. Because the other person's already out. Yeah. So they, they both ended up getting in, and they they had a match, and I don't know. They, they Again, they tried. The director of TNA needs to be uh, hung from a tree. Yeah, the firing is not good enough. He must be tortured. By the leg. I don't want people thinking I want to kill somebody, but uh, this person needs to be sent out to pasture because... Let me explain something to the director of TNA, who is the worst director I, I think I've ever seen. There's a thing called rest holds. A guy puts another guy in a chin lock, okay? When two dudes are laying on the mat in a chin lock, do a long shot of the crowd. When two dudes are running the ropes, don't take a long shot of the crowd there, dumbass, because something may happen. Jackie gave Gail a German suplex and dropped her right on the head, but guess what? We didn't see it because in the middle of the high spot, the director did this long shot showing the whole crowd. And then, I swear to Christ Almighty, Jackie puts her to chin lock. And this was when the director just decided to hold that shot, a close-up of the chin lock. How can you possibly be so stupid? I don't know. You're employed as a director of a wrestling show, and you're so fucking stupid. They do this all the time. This guy misses finishes. He misses high spots. How? I don't know. You would think that this applies to any sport. There's always... And I don't care what sport you watch. If it's hockey, racing, football, there's exciting stuff and there's boring stuff. You show the crowd during the boring stuff. I am sweating bullets right now, just ranting about the stupidity of this dumb fuck. So then, anyway, the, the finish, uh, Jackie was by the door, so you'll never guess what happened. Gail slammed the cage door on her face. Yep. Mm-hmm. Never seen that one before. And she had the opportunity to escape, but no. She decided to climb up and sit on top of the cage and do a high cross, of which she completely overshot uh, Jackie. And, and uh, you know, if she'd overshot her by another inch, she would have just gone straight over her head. Yeah. And then I don't know what they would have done, because this was the finish. As it was, she, like, dove off the cage, and, and her rib cage hit uh, Jackie's forehead, and Jackie took the bump, and they sold it like she'd been knocked unconscious. And, and Gail crashed and burned, but, of course, she made the cover and got the pin. And the effort was there, but uh, eh, two and a quarter, and I'm being very generous. It, this, yeah, it would get worse. <laughs> it's definitely not the worst match we saw tonight, but it, this is nothing special, absolutely nothing you need to go out of your way to see, and certainly nothing you'd want to pay money for. Austin Starn sent she with Bob Backlund as a referee. Bob Backlund's insane, but you know what? He actually was not a detriment to this match. No? He's he's a 58-year-old man. He looks uh, at least 20 years, 15, 20 years younger. I've actually seen guys that are 38, and he looks 20 years younger. Uh, but uh, he had this, this uh, you know, he did fine, and, and they had a good match, probably three stars, maybe even the best match on the show, for all I know. And And they worked very hard, and... And uh, it was good stuff, and Star hit the 450, but Senshi kicked out, so Star and Backlund got in an argument, and Backlund pushed him into a rolling reverse cradle by Senshi and, and then counted the pin, and Star freaked out afterwards and said if Backlund thought he was crazy, he hadn't seen nothing yet. So apparently they're going to have a battle of just madmen, which I'm fine with. That's what we encourage on the show. It's really what the show is, is a battle of madmen. 
I don't know what the fuck was up with, with Austin Starr's hair tonight. We were trying to figure out which <laughs> 1970s sitcom character he looked like. Buddy was saying he looked like Christopher Lloyd from Taxi. I thought he looked like uh, Larry from Three's Company, but regardless, it was odd. Uh, but which one was Larry? Larry was uh, uh, the friend. It was. It was not Mr. Uh, not Mr. Furley. That was okay. Don Knotts. No, but Larry was the friend. I was gonna of, say if you if you were thinking he looked like Don Knotts, then no. Buddy wins. <laughs> no, I was not thinking of that guy. Uh, the good news is this probably was the best match in the show. Uh, both guys are good. Sinji in particular. You watch most of these guys like Sanjay Dutt, and they're doing their flippy moves. They get up. Since he's offense, and I, I know what you're going to say, but his offense looks like he's trying to hurt his opponent and win the match. Probably because he's actually kicking the hell out of them. But it's just like when he goes on offense, it makes everybody else in the show just like a, a total clown. He, he is so much better than all of them. I, I, I will not go that far. Um, Steiner killing folks, Angle like killing folks. I, I was thinking more of the, the, the X Division guys. I see. Right, more, more of the... the Sanji in particular, but but other guys, even even Austin Starr in this match, it's like it was like when 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 Starr was on offense, it was okay they're doing stuff, and and then since she took over, it was like okay now the show has begun. Since she was very great this evening, so then we had a um, there were two things on the show that were by far the the greatest things on the show. They were both interviews. The first was by Samoa Joe. Everybody needs to see the Samoa Joe promo. It was awesome. And everyone also needs to see the Conan promo. Yes. It was awesome. These two promos were fantastic, and it made me happy to be a wrestling fan. I'm here at the Samoan Submission Machine, Samoa Jojo. You've asked for this time to make a public statement in regards to Jeff Jarrett being number five, and i got to ask you, Kurt Angle, he wants to know where you are. He wants to track you down. Kurt's going to track me down. Kurt's looking for me. Well, where were you, Kurt? Where were you two weeks ago when I wanted to know who my partner was? Where were you? When I asked you, when I pleaded with you, when I begged you to tell me who our fifth man was, you were nowhere to be seen. So if you want to find me, it's not that hard. It's never been that hard, Kurt. In fact, it's always been a little bit too convenient for you to not find me when it counts. Oh, and we want to find me. Tell me that Jared lost his advantage tonight. How convenient! How convenient, Kurt! For all the integrity that you got, you have no intelligence! Don't you see what's happening? Don't you see what's going on around you, Kurt? Can't you open your eyes? You scumbag, Jared! You think for one minute, you think for one minute you have me fooled. You see, for as much as I hate Kurt, for as much as I despise Kurt, you and me, we will never get along. We will never get along. And as for tonight, make your move, Jared. I know what's coming. I know what you want to do. I know what your plan is. And I beg you, I beg you to cross that line. Come at me, because when you do, I will be there waiting. I will break you. I will maim you. I will kill you. And for anybody else that gets in the way of my title shot tonight, you will feel the same fate. It's a war tonight, and I go to war handicapped. But I'll be damned if I don't come out the victor. Joe basically said he was going to kill anybody that tried to stop him from getting his title shot tonight. They would die, he said. And uh, it was great. He, he built up for that. He said, he said he would beat them, then maim them, and then kill them. But yes, he promised violence, and he, he's the very angry, scary Samoan. And I would not want to be the guy who got in his way. Then we saw the worst match in the history of St. Louis wrestling, dating back decades. A match that had... Uh, God, if Larry Manisic was at this show... <laughs> I don't even know what to say. That if this, oh, what a shot! And the referee's going to have to put the hood back on. But that's what I'm talking about, what a vicious shot! By Wildcat, Chris Harris, and he just nailed James Storm with it. Well, you're right, the hood went flying right off the head of James Storm. He just got rocked. Rudy Charles applies that hood right back on the head of Storm. And then the cheap shot from Storm caught it with the knee. Exchange here now. You see the scoop and slam by Storm. And you can see now that James Storm frits James Storm on even footing with only one eye. Well, Storm lucked out that time. He was backing towards that corner, and he just right, right through. That hood right through that blindfold, he just break the eyes of the Wildcat. Oh, no, look at this. He doesn't want to put it back on. And he's, he's just going to the crowd as they're yelling at him. And he won't put it back on now, but it's still an advantage to him. He kind of has an idea now where the Wildcat Chris Harris is. One shot after the other. They can almost feel each other. And, oh, again, Storm. Oh, but he spears him right off the top of the rope. And Storm doesn't even have the mask on. Oh, yeah, the hood being put back into place now by senior official Rudy Charles. 
And now here comes the count from referee Charles. And up to a knee. You can see Storm back up to both feet now. Swing and a miss. Shot off into the ropes. He just backed right up into the Wildcat. And Harris takes him up. Boom, Nelson slams One, him down. Pin two, two, go. The shoulder up and again. The hood has come off the head of the Wildcat, Chris Harris. When you can see that that hood's come off and they put it back on. But Wildcat Chris Harris, though, able to get a glimpse of where James Storm is right now. It was so bad. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Did I not say several days ago that this was a stupid idea? I could have sworn I did. The, the blindfold match inside a steel cage? I have been known to be a wrestling prophet. If you look back at old issues of Figure Four Weekly, ask Nut Bunnies. I was a wrestling prophet here. Unfortunately, it didn't take much prognostication to determine that this was going to suck. You may not be in the minority predicting a bad match here. They... They have Chris Harris and James Storm, who had been a tag team for four-plus years, back dating back to the very beginning. They'd been a tag team forever. They were such a great team, at least according to the TNA fans, that when they first were about to break up, there was a great backlash. And they were not broken up. They remained together. And then pretty soon everyone was like, okay, you can break them up now. So they did the big angle to, to break them up, and, and this was going to be their – they've never had a singles match. Uh, they've never had a singles match. This was the first match of the feud. And and they decided that the first James Storm versus Chris Harris match would be a blindfold match in a steel cage. Because James Storm cost Chris Harris 70% of his vision. I don't know if he needed that 70% for, but that was, the, that was the stipulation. A blindfold match in a steel cage. They were not blindfolded. They had hoods put on them. And... As soon as the bell rang, the people were chanting, Fire Russo. Ten seconds into the match, they were chanting this. And the men stumbled around, not making contact. Like two minutes, they stumbled around, not touching each other. The fans chanted, We want wrestling. So finally, Harris punched him, and Storm's hood fell off. So the ref put it back on. You see, there were these hoods that had drawstrings, but they didn't actually pull the drawstring, because, you know... Maybe you wouldn't be able to breathe. So the hoods kept falling off. The fans chanted, boring. They had uh, more wackiness and involved uh, hoods falling off and such. Harris's hood actually fell off when they were on the top rope. And and, uh, and the best part was he had no hood on, but Storm did. And Harris had to pretend like he couldn't see the blindfolded man about to give him a spear off the top rope. Fell into the ring. Uh, Harris hit a full Nelson slam, and his hood fell off, and the ref was more concerned about the hood than the pinfall. And uh, the fans were chanting, end this now. They were chanting, someone stop this. Harris actually went to put a scorpion death lock on uh, Storm, but actually put it on the referee instead. And as the ref was down, the dastardly Storm took his hood off, hit a super kick, put the hood back on, and got the pin. It was horrible. Anybody, including you, Vince, that says this is the worst match you've ever seen, I will say uh, you are sorely mistaken. And I, I will sit you down and make you watch some of the aforementioned horrible matches if you think this was the worst ever. This was, don't get me wrong, horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. But uh, not the worst match I've ever seen. Okay, here's why I will just disagree with that last statement. They were fucked from the beginning. They had the shitty gimmick. They knew it. The fans knew it. The ref knew it. Everyone knew it except those who actually could put this together. So they did what they could. They, they, they did all the blindfold spots. They did the, I will walk around. Even though I know he's starting the opposite corner, I will walk around the ring and hope he's still there when I get there. They did that. They did, we will cross across the ring and just miss each other two shifts passing in the night. They did that. They, 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 they did the, we will... Accidentally back into each other, swing a punch wildly, and both fall down. They did all that. They did everything they could they could try. And then the shit happened with the hood starting to fall off. Storm's hood fell off, and they put it back on. They kept doing their wacky blindfold match. Storm's hood fell off a second time, and that's where I noted, hey, his hood keeps falling off because the drawstring has fallen out. He was standing there in the corner, holding the hood in his hands, looking at the ref. Harris is over the other corner, blindfold on, and the drawstring is clearly lying there in the middle of the ring. So the ref takes the drawstring, picks it up, and throws it out of the crowd, then walks over and places the hood with no drawstring onto James Storm's head. 
So here is James Storm, the evil cowboy who attempted to blind his tag team partner, who now has a hood that is being on his head, and the only thing keeping it on there is his moral code. It's his, his view of justice to keep the hood on himself so as not to use an unfair advantage on his opponent. At that point, they should have just ended it. And because they did not, because they said, no, we've got to get all our shit in. That is why it was the worst match I ever saw. I can't even believe you would call this the worst match you've ever seen. Because I, I, I'm giving, giving it somewhat on a curve in that my, I'm offended that they, that they thought, we'll save it. We'll do the spear off the side of the cage. That will save the match. The fact that they had that arrogance, that offends me. <laughs> the Naturals versus Matt Farmer and Christelle Soul was a also, better match than this. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe not. Um, it's very close. The Bushwhackers <laughs> versus Casey <laughs> oh, oh. and Nikolai Volkov was a better match than this. Honestly, I remember nothing about that except the soft slam. I have to watch that again to make a different call. I will grant you that the natural set versus Matt Farmer and Crystal Soul was tight. <laughs> that was worse. <laughs> I, I, I take you to task for this because I know that we've even watched Ring of Honor matches where you've gotten physically angry, which you did not get in this match. You were laughing throughout the match <laughs> okay. at the absurdity. Yeah, this, this, this may have crossed us so far over into horrible that it achieved a, 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 a perverse entertainment form. So I guess in that sense, I will agree. It was, not the, it was certainly not, not the most boring match I ever saw, but it was such bullshit. This was a horrible match. <laughs> this, the this avalanche was... against Big Wood... Was a better match than this. Avalanche and Big Wood was not the worst match of that show. Well, <laughs> Blind Drive and the Russian was worse. Okay. <laughs> that was the worst match I ever saw. This was the worst match I ever saw, okay, probably on pay-per-view. This, I, 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 I say again, I do not recall most of Sheik and Volkov versus the Bushwhackers, <laughs> and I've, I've also blocked off most of Briscoe versus Patterson in the, in the evening gown match. This was very bad, everybody. This sucked ten cops. <laughs> very if this is not win the worst match of the year, that means we'll see something there. even shittier, and that sucks. Yes, this this was bad. This was historically bad. Uh, then we had Jerry Lynn and Chris Daniels, which these poor fuckers, they had to follow that last match. And, I mean, you've never seen a crowd have the wind taken out of its sails like this crowd was after the, uh, that last match. I mean, they they didn't care about... Any, they were done. They oh, were finished. I, uh, they stayed only because they had paid money. These guys came out, and it's like the crowd was dead. And they knew the crowd wasn't going to react to anything, so they just did their match. It didn't matter. They, they, they did everything. They got no reaction for anything. They just kept working. <laughs> they worked and worked and worked, and they traded near falls. And and, uh, and the, the funniest part to me is is after all of this, Daniels did like a um, that thing where you the, the downward spiral or whatever off the top rope, and everyone chanted, "This is awesome." Yes, and I was like, "No, it's really not." Seriously, <laughs> now that 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 chant needs to be somehow the fans need to be punished when they chant that. And it's, let me tell you, when you make that chant, when you're watching a match and you can't help but chant, "This is awesome." Like when you're jumping up and down and sweat's flying and your you and urine is is trickling down your leg, then fine. Chant this is awesome, okay? Don't just chant it because after a match that you haven't given a flying fuck about these 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 fans could not have given two fucks about this match. And there's one move off the top, and they all of a sudden start jumping up and chanting, "This is awesome." I was like, "You all suck. Every single one of you fans in St. Louis. God bless you all, but you suck." What a waste. You just got a promo on the fans. Well, it's ridiculous. I'm not blaming I mean, you. It, it's just like, save that chant for when it means something. You, all you're doing is prostituting what used to be a cool chant. It, it's now like, it's just retarded. Now it, it, the chant has become a parody of itself. Yeah, now it's a joke. <laughs> this when, is when, awesome. When something is so clearly not awesome and you chant, this is awesome, you, know, the, the, you keep waiting for the fans to chant, no, it isn't. Yeah, why don't they? We need those fans. A anybody listening to this right now, you need to start that chant the next time you hear that stupid, this is awesome during something that... Don't get me wrong, it was, you know, they tried very hard, and it was pretty good, but no, it was not awesome. It was definitely not awesome. There was nothing on this show that was awesome. I'm sorry. Well, awesomely bad, perhaps. Well, there, there was stuff I was staring at with my jaw hanging open in awe, but all I remember about this match is the wacky finish where they teased their finishers off the top. 
And when Jerry Lynn, Jerry Lynn teased the cradle pile driver off the top rope, I thought, no, if you try that, you will kill Christopher Daniels. Don't do it. And they didn't. They dropped down, and, and then I think they just did like a roll-up finish for the pin. <laughs> they did a last right. A last right for the pin, which is not much better than a roll-up. But clean, yes. clean pin by Chris Daniels. It was the match. Then we had the awesome promo by uh, Conan. Just the best line was, he said he didn't know what was more boring, watching Team 3D wrestle or listen to a Christy Hemi promo. And I laughed. He's great. God damn, I laughed. This was such a beautiful promo. Everybody needs to see it. I'd almost recommend buying the pay-per-view for those two promos, but I won't. Don't buy this. LAX versus Team 3D for the NWA Tag Team Titles Electrified Cage Match. They... Okay, going into this, both teams were concerned about this match because they didn't want it to come off as hokey. And they they were assured it just won't be hokey. They were lied to. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, electrify the steel We talked about how dangerous the matches are at this lockdown pay-per-view. I don't think it can get much more dangerous than this, Don West. I understand that at different times there's, there's alternating currents of electricity. There's different levels at different times, the ebb and the flow. And if you make contact with that electrified steel paint, they can absolutely immobilize you. Here we go, Team 3D turned loose. And I bring up Hernandez. He's got him up high. It's going to be the border guards. Can he do it to Brother Devon? And he throws him right in! Oh, God! Right in! And he just the electricity staff him! Neither does the back elbow! And it's time to take the big push up right into the electrified cage again! They turn the lights down in the building, they put a spotlight over the ring. There was a, a tube that they hooked up to the side of the cage in which juice was flowing, they claimed. Turn on the juice, said Mike Tanay. And at that point... There was a humming noise, like a flying saucer from a 1955 sci-fi film was hovering somewhere in the building. This just strange buzz. And they said the current was going to come and go during this match. It was going to be, I guess, more dangerous at certain points, but we didn't really know when. I guess when the thing hummed louder, it was more dangerous. But they had a match, and, and nobody cared. I mean, this was the big... 20th title win for Team 3D. The next the next big uh, match is part of their legacy. This, that, and the other thing, and the crowd was just quiet. And I think 3D made a comeback at some point, but I don't know, because there was, like, I don't know. They were doing moves. No one cared. No one cared about any damn thing anyone did. A phantom member of the Latino Nation took Conan down to the ring in his wheelchair, and who should make the save but Hector Garza? Guerrero. Or Hector Guerrero. <laughs> God, it should have been Hector Garza. Hector uh, Guerrero made the save, and, and everybody thought that he was going to turn on the Dudleys, but, of course, he did not. He just uh, threatened to hit Conan. And Bubba asked for a table, and, and he gave it to him, and just stuff was happening. And I guess the big thing was, I think it was uh, Devon finally got thrown into the cage. And when he hit the cage, the lights flickered. There was a strobe effect. And there was a loud sound that sounded like this. And then he fell in the cage and just started shaking. And everyone immediately booed. Oh, yeah. It was just the stupidest thing you've ever seen. And, of course, then he was up about ten seconds later for a uh, doomsday device. So really sold that electrocution right there, Devon. And then somebody else got thrown in. Oh, the finish was uh, supposed to be them throwing Homicide into the cage and, and buzzing him. And then as he came off the cage, giving the 3D. But, of course, he fell down. They dropped him. So they had to try the finish again, and they, they hit it the second time. And after finally winning the NWA titles, after finally winning their 20th set of, of tag team belts, they just cut away. That's it. That's it. That was a celebration. They just cut away. We <laughs> didn't see any celebration. They, they raised their hands and cut away. That was, They went backstage, and that was the end of Team 3D. This also sucks several cocks. Not quite as many cocks. This is horrid. <laughs> this was a lot of, you know, four guys lying under a blue light, they were trying to tease the execution by pushing. They were trying to push each other into the fence and and fight back. So that was you know, two guys laying there pushing your, their hand to the fence. The best part was Homicide had Bubba by the wrist, and he's taking his wrist forward and trying to push into the cage. 
and Bubba has his fingers stretched out. <laughs> like, he's trying to touch the cage, and then remembers, oh, wait, it's electric. And makes a fist to pull his fingers back into the Well, no, it wasn't even that. It was, it was they were trying to get him there, and, and I guess to make it look more dramatic, he extended his fingers so they'd be closer. And I, and I thought, why are you saying your fingers? <laughs> you, it's, it's, uh, that, that, will, that will zap you. Oh, God, it was bad. And, and, and like, it. there were some spots where they actually were touching the cage on accident, but not getting electrocuted. Yeah, and, every time, and guys went up top all the time. Every time they did, they brushed the cage, nothing happened. Devon in very short order, order bled, and, and, you know, we, we, when a black man in a black shirt under a blue light bleeds, you can't see it. It's not there. And, and everyone bled some, and, and, and they, there was gloves involved, and no one gave a shit about anything. And, and like you said, when, when, when Devon went in for the electrocution, and someone backstage flicked the light switch up and down about five times, and that was the end of that, ugh. Oh. People were just sick with they, what they were seeing. They could have just done what, I mean, at the very least, do what WSX does and have the thing blow up. Have they some could have fun. had a little, yeah, have put a flash pot up there. Yeah, do something. A what? A flash pot's a term for a pyro that blows up. No, it'd be too hokey. Just blow up the whole cage. You need to put a bomb underneath it every time somebody uh, hits that thing or something like that. This was just This bad. did not work. Finally, we had war games. You know the deal. Two guys in the ring, five minutes, and then everyone else comes in at two-minute intervals. Listen, there was all the big debate about the order of entry. Vince Russo wanted the heels or the baby faces to have the advantage. Everybody said, no, it's fucking stupid. The heels are supposed to have the advantage. That's the whole point of the psychology of the match. And so, as we mentioned, they, they uh, compromised, and then Russo got his way, but they, they were going to reverse the decision, which they did on this show. So anyway, in the end, the heels had the advantage. And, and obviously, for those of you new, let me explain what, how this works. It's like a tag team match. Two men beat on one, and then one man beats on two. That's it. So you have a War Games match, and, and you have a baby face and a heel start out. And then, in order to, to build heat, the next guy ends a heel. Because then you've got two heels beating on one baby face. Now, if you have the baby face come in first, all of a sudden you've got two baby faces double teaming one heel, and everyone's like, boy, what bullies? Who cares? And you get sympathy for the heel when he makes his comeback. Yes, that's not what you want. I'm telling this to Vince Russo since he's so stupid he can't figure out the, the very simple human psychology dating back millennia. So then... The idea, obviously, is is you have the baby face and heel, and the heel comes in. So it's two on one. Two on one. That'll work in a million years. Two on one. Then you have a baby face come out, and it, it's a big comeback for the baby faces. But then another heel comes in. The odds run even again. And the heels lay waste to those baby faces. Just beat the fuck out of them. Then a heel comes or a baby face comes in and evens the odds shortly, but then, nope, another heel comes in. Keep the heat on the baby faces because they're outnumbered. 300. The oldest story in the fucking book. So anyway, after all of this debate and all of this bullshit and all of this this wackiness and and reverse decisions and such, they finally get the uh, heels to have the advantage. And what does it mean? Nothing. Because when you had one baby face and two heels, the baby face just kept making a comeback. Mm Mm-hmm. When you had two baby faces and three heels, even though the heels had the advantage, the baby faces were just in control, and vice versa. Sometimes the uh, it would be even, and, and the heels would be uh, running wild, and then you'd have another heel come in, but the baby faces would make a comeback. Well, there were more heels in the ring. So really, this was an utter failure. All that bullshit about the numbers advantage, and it didn't mean a goddamn thing. Because they didn't use any of the traditional war game psychology in this match. And you wonder why nobody cared. Until the very end when everybody was in there and everybody started doing stupid shit. Angle and AJ brawled on top of the cage. Joe did a tope to the outside. All sorts of uh, wackiness. They had Harley Race out there. God bless Harley Race, but uh, he can't move. He looks... So old and so broken down. It was so sad. And if this were WWE and they were in St. Louis, they'd put Harley Race in the front row. 
He'd sit there the whole show. They'd put the makeup on him. They'd put him in a nice outfit. He'd wave to the crowd. Everybody would be happy. Instead, Harley Race is out here in sweatpants and a polo shirt, hobbling down to the ring. He can barely move, and they say he's there as the outside. He's there to make sure there's no interference. In a cage match. That's what the cage is there for. Harley Race is going to make sure there's no interference in this cage match. There's no one listening to this who could not have gotten past Harley Race into the cage. Oh, Jesus God. So, so uh, and then thumbtacks were had to do a bit, and so um, here's here's the other thing I hated. We had guys outside. We had a bis getting thumbtacks, and we had AJ and Angle on top of the cage. And all during all of this, Harley Race punched Jim Mitchell. And he punched him at a point where three other things were going on at the exact same time. So they briefly showed it, cut away, and never talked about it again. And it's like, what was the point? What was the fucking point of that? So ended up with a bunch of guys outside and angled through AJ off the uh, roof. And AJ did a, a flip dive, basically, on all the guys outside. And they had one camera angle. Our good buddy, the director of TNA, who needs to be hung by his leg from a tree, there was one camera angle. And all it was was AJ falling from the top of the cage, and you didn't even see where he landed or who he landed on. He just flew off screen. <laughs> and then the cameraman backed up, and there was a pile of men. That's correct. That was the, they didn't have a second a camera. They didn't have an overhead camera. They didn't have every camera focused on AJ Styles, which you think they would. How many angles do they have of Foley going off the cage? Oh, dozens. About 15. How many angles do they have of AJ Styles going off the top of this cage? One, from down below, looking straight up so he flew off camera. And then all of a sudden they, they look back and there's men there. Risked his fucking life, and the fucking director didn't get one good shot of it. Beautiful. So, end up in the ring, and, and Christian went into the thumbtacks, and and uh, this and that. And, and finally, the big finish was... Um, Abyss put thumbtacks in the guitar. Jarrett grabbed it, wound up, but Sting was there. Was he going to hit Sting? No. He said, Sting, get out of the way. He hit Abyss, who was just standing there like an idiot waiting for it. So Abyss was down, hit by a guitar filled with tacks. And and uh, and whoever hit him with this. Uh, Jarrett hit him with it. Jarrett. Jarrett points to Sting and goes, cover him. And Sting wasn't sure and, and set, thought about it for about a good 20 minutes. Hmm. Hmm. That, that's what wrestling is coming in 2007. Hmm. Hmm. Should I do this cover? So he finally covers and gets the pin, and then and then Jarrett shook hands with everybody, except one man. One man was angry. Angle. Not Joe. Not Joe. Angle. The man who had brought Jarrett onto his team was mad that Jarrett had helped his team win. Welcome to TNA. And then the show ended. Okay. Stupid thing number one. You you covered this already, but AJ's dive off the cage onto the pile is missed by the camera. This dive was much, much scarier than the dive AJ took last month in the scaffold match. This was a scarier, a scarier bump than that, and it got missed. Stupid thing number two. Joe, after cutting the promo about how he will maim and kill anyone who gets in the way of his title shot, calmly shakes Jarrett's hand and welcomes him into the good guy club. So he just didn't care about losing a shot anymore. Stupid thing number three, as you noted, Angle was the one who was pissed off that his uh, his title shot had been taken away. When, in fact, he was the one who brought it on, on his team. When, in fact, he was the one who climbed up onto the roof, therefore making it impossible for him to pin anybody. And then after throwing AJ off, sitting down and going, Woo! Like he had, I just killed a man, yeah! And then he just stayed up there. <laughs> he was trapped, I guess. The original War Games came out it, it, when they did when they did War Games during Great American Bash 1987. I was 12, I guess, and the local video video store, like Video West, or whatever it was called, there was no Blockbuster Video in 1987. They had a copy of this, and I must have rented this 30 times. And I watched it like every weekend when I was 12. I've seen War Games a lot. Let me tell you something. When Dusty Rhodes was being double teamed by Tully and Arn for two minutes. He did not, 15 seconds before the save was about to be made, he didn't make a comeback. No. He took his whooping until someone came to help him out. It's very simple. For five minutes, Dusty beat up Arn Anderson. 
Tully Blanchard came in. They beat up Dusty for two minutes. Not one minute and 45, not one minute and 50, two minutes. Then I, I think Nikita was in next. I could be wrong on that part. But the point is, <laughs> it, was, it, it was very neat and clean segments. Five minutes once I was winning. But then for two minutes, they just alternated. Bad guys had the advantage. They went past for two minutes. You guys had the advantage. They went past for two minutes. And, just, and it goes. And everything makes sense. It also helped that for that match, both teams were at ringside. And, and for this match, guys were making the full entrance. They came down the ramp. So for Rhino, hey, his entrance is he sprints down the ramp anyway. So he got there in like three seconds. Christian's entrance, he's walking down, moseying down to enter this brutal blood fight. And by the time he gets in, that's 30 seconds of their two-man advantage gone. Just stupid. This show sucked. Yeah. I, I don't understand how pro wrestling can be booked so poor. I, I don't understand. There's nothing simpler than war games. Yeah, there's a tag team match, and we've seen that fucked up this year. I, I would say War Games is even simpler. All, all War Games is is a series of run-ins. <laughs> and every time one side gets a run-in, then they win. There's nothing else to think of. There's literally nothing else to think about. It's a series of run-ins inside a cage. That's all it is. And and, and, and I don't know how, after after it has been, has been done correctly, Lord knows how many times in the, in the old NWA slash WCW, whatever you want to call it, I have seen it done poorly in Major League Wrestling. I seen it done poorly in TNA. I don't I've know seen it how. done poorly in WCW. <laughs> and, we, and we have seen it done very poorly near the end of WCW. I don't know how. <laughs> because people don't think. And, 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 and I can't believe this one on Russo. I can, because Russo was not the one making the comeback with, with 10 seconds to go. No, Angle, that was you. Kurt Angle needs to go back and watch the original War Games to learn how to do it. Yes, this, this frustrated and angered me. So anyway... Everybody, do yourself a favor. Don't buy this pay-per-view. Do us a favor. Don't buy this pay-per-view. Yes. Just, when I, yeah, there's a UFC show coming up on Saturday for free. Just watch that and, and get backlash or something like that. Or Those matches are also all in a cage. Get a replay of WrestleMania or just go fucking buy some old uh, Great American Bashes or something like that. Yeah. Get the goddamn Horseman DVD. For fuck's sake, get the Horseman DVD before you get this stupid fucking show. Just thumbs down. I don't know. Damn it. A lot of people tried, but... Wrestling ain't that hard. Why do people have to make it so hard and so bad? Everything on the show. TNA. Mike TNA was in a dark ring. Okay. <laughs> Should we just stop the show now? Uh, we watched a lot of wrestling this week, folks. We did. We're... We're Tired of it all. Don said he had some news that most people might not know that Jarrett was dealing with a very personal issue. Actually, this is very sad. They, they have not mentioned this yet, but Jarrett's wife has cancer, and she's taken a turn for the worst, and I am surprised that Jarrett has come back. This, If I were him, this is not when I would come back. The only thing I can think is is he needs something to get his mind off life or something of that nature. But uh, he, he shows up to the building, he goes to the ring, he does his segment, he was talking here, and he, he almost lost it, and then as soon as his segment was over, he flew immediately home. I mean, he didn't even wait for the end of the taping. So, this is, um, it's all true, it, it kind of is a little bit strange, because it's too true to be making a storyline out of, you know what I mean? Well, it, it's like they're they're waiting for bad news so he'll be more of a baby face, you know what God, I mean? God, I hope that's not I know that's not it. what they're doing, but that's sort of the way it comes off, you it, know what I mean? It, it, it was very, it was weird. Don West, he, all he said was an illness in the family. Yes. Which, I mean, that doesn't, it, it's worse than that. It, it, you think illness in the family, you think... His dad is sick, or his mom is sick. It's his wife. Yes, and that's you know, frankly, worse. Yes, that's that's more horrible. Um, and and I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's odd. And, and the only thing I can think is, and I'm not in Jeff Jarrett's head. I don't know what he's thinking, or and I've never I've never been through anything like that. But I can see how someone in that position would want to throw themselves into their work as a distraction or as as a way to not feel helpless. Sure, as a way I, to try to do something I, constructive. And I understand that, but. But to take something like that, and now that's part of the fake pro wrestling story, that's the part to me that's weird. Now, this didn't come off as as anything. I can't fault this segment or anything like that. I'm just worried about where it goes from here. You know what I mean? 
I'm, I'm very iffy about this. I wish they would just ax that part of the whole thing. I, I don't want to hear about that whole part of the whole thing because, you know, w- w- what do you do? What if the worst happens? All of a sudden, that's uh, they played up on TV and, and try to get sympathy for him. That would suck. That would suck greatly. That would very violently but, suck. But, but when you're in a situation like this, where where you know things are getting very bad, you know, and it, it's it's certain certain things may be inevitable. I mean, when you're in that position, I don't understand why you start because you know if something does happen, then what? Then you're then you're you're making it into a, a fake pro wrestling story on on a show like this where no one takes anything seriously and everything's a joke. I don't like this. No, no I don't thumbs, like it. Thumbs down for that idea. They need to end this this the, the 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 family illness aspect of this needs to be ended immediately. But um, anyway, he came out and he he talked about uh, this and that, Sting, blah blah blah, and basically Sting came out. And then Angle came out, and, and as they were arguing, Jared just disappeared. So, I don't, I don't know the whole... Uh... Anyway, the whole point was Angle and Sting are going to have a match on TV next week. The very first ever Sting versus Kurt Angle match in the history of wrestling. Free Eye Impact. With seven days build. Yeah, seven Which, days. which is, to their credit, is seven days more than you would have expected. Seven days build. So And, and yes, for free. Anyway, Christian... And his wacky crew were backstage. Christian said he'd gotten himself a shot at the tag titles. He was berating Abyss, chewing him out for embarrassing the whole team at the pay per view. Said that, and then he and then he announced that Abyss was his partner. <laughs> you yeah, have all these guys on your team, and you choose the guy you hate the most. That was not logical. No, that was irrational. It was very dumb, in fact. I don't even know why these guys are still a team, because in theory they were only on Christian's side so they could try to get a title shot in war games. That didn't happen. They're still chums. You're thinking too much. I guess I am. He said if they did not leave the show tonight with three belts, you're in big trouble. That was his threat to Abyss. Mm -hmm. Daniels, Rhino, AJ, and Samoa Joe. Daniels wore a sting mask to the ring yet again, so I guess they're going to have a feud at some point, and... They had a, a final match there, good little TV match, and then Daniels hit Rhino in the face with the Sting baseball bat as Ruff was distracted and got the pin. Dave was saying people were raving about this in the reports, and then he added a line. I hope this is edited. I assume this was. This, this is too. It was fine, but it was not very long. <laughs> and I, I think they clipped it for TV, and that sucks. Barash interviewed Angle, who said earlier tonight. Sting made the biggest mistake of his career. He noted that Sting had been in the business twenty years. He'd been in eight. At which point, I. <laughs> it's true, but it's impossible. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's had a 20 year career in eight years. He broke in in 1999. Yes. I've been in the business for a year when Kurt Angle started. <laughs> How is that even possible? It, it's. Many things about Kurt Angle confound me. Every time I'm reminded that Kurt Angle is older than X Pac. <laughs> How can that be? Well, many reasons why. <laughs> Gail and Chris Harris came out for a match, and then outran Jackie Moore, and they had a little brawl. It ended up with Chris Harris and Robert Roode. Tracy and Eric Young were there. And in this segment, we had seven people, Harris, Gail, Jackie, Tracy, Young, Roode, and Storm, everybody doing all sorts of stuff. And Harris hit the catatonic. Tracy pulled the ref out of the ring. Eric pulled Tracy away. Blah, blah, blah. Root finally clonked Harris with handcuffs for the pin. Are you confused? Good. I am, too. I have notes, though. So. Uh, Eric shoved Tracy on her ass afterwards. Root slapped him around, said he was tired of Eric trying to make a fool out of him. And Anyway, it built up to Eric, I guess, Petey going, Eric, who's your friend? Or, or uh, <laughs> Petey Williams ain't your friend or something. And Eric said, he, he's not my friend. He's not the friend. I'm like, yeah, I think no, he's, he's, a, he's not my friend. Okay. And I'm like, what an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> then Rude's like, what do you mean he's not the friend? And so Eric's like, I have another friend. And <laughs> Rude said, well, who's the friend? And I'm thinking, who, who the cares? fuck cares? What does a friend have to do with anything? No one knows. What does a friend have to do with anything? I'm looking at everybody in this room, <laughs> and everybody's just shaking their head at me. I don't know who cares about this. I don't know what this friend is supposedly doing. I don't know why Robert Roode cares. So Robert Roode says, 
Okay, next week, tell me the friend or you're fired. And Eric's like, done. Oh, no. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Which, of course, begs the question, lie? <laughs> you could lie. Can't you say my friend's Gary? <laughs> you want to know who my friend is, Robert Rude? My friend's Frank. He lives down the street. Frank. He can't lie. He get burgers. Yeah. Eric Young is is... He, he's just trapped. <laughs> he's trapped by his own conscience. He must tell the truth about the secret friend who is his friend. And that's all we know. And apparently, Bobby Wood is also trapped by his own conscience because he will not force Eric to tell us right now. No, he's gonna he is going to give him seven days. You have a week. <laughs> you have a week to tell us your friend's name. None of this makes a damn lick of sense, no. This whole storyline is the... I could write a book... About this, the stupidest storyline I've ever heard of in my whole life. Bobby Roode versus Eric Young and Why It Sucks by Dr. Brian Alvarez. Why? I don't know. Why can't Eric Roode or Eric Young just quit? I don't know. Why is he out of the business Why? forever? I, no one knows. Why does Robert Roode want Eric Young? A fine question. <laughs> what does a friend have to do with anything? I don't know. None of this matters. None of this means anything. I would kill for these answers. Do you understand? <laughs> Brian, they're not out there. i got to get, like, Dixie Carter on the show or, or somebody and just go, please just explain this storyline to me. that. Get Eric Young on the show. Ask him. He, he doesn't know. That's my point. <laughs> but I want, I want whoever wrote this to try and explain this to me because I don't get it. Well, no one gets it. It's ungettable. God. It can't be getting. Anyway... Shark Boy! Why can't he say Shark Boy is my friend? Because <laughs> no one will believe anyone will be fishy, friends with Shark Boy. My fishy pal. <sighs> anyway, the match yeah. was actually okay when you were not paying attention to the other 17 people running around doing stuff. It was the, the usual story of TNA, two guys who could probably have a good match and then ruined with bullshit. Jim Mitchell was bitching in his monster backstage, saying if he screwed anything up tonight, the old woman go to prison for perjury, obstruction of justice, and attempted murder. And he was ranting and raving in a fashion that made it clear that Jim Mitchell hates his storyline. <laughs> That's all I can say. Then we had another deal with the X Division dudes. I cannot believe the black machismo thing is taken off to the level it has. Like, address our problem night here, Kevin. Yeah? So how come I'm not teaming with the black kid next week? Well, easy, I miss. What do you mean, the black kid? I mean, the black kid. The board says I'm teaming with Kaz Ayashi, who doesn't even work here. The thing is, I've worked it out. My man's going to go over to Sanjay yeah. and Black Machismo in a little three-way. Whoa! Three-way? Hey, give him a one-woman man. Yeah, this is good enough for me. I doubt it. So talking about a match for the belt. <laughs> yeah, making sense now. Yeah, making sense. Yeah, you're making a lot of sense. Everything's taken off. Hey, listen, is everything all right? Yeah, yeah, everything is cool. Uh, mm, cool. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Uh, what about Sanjay, huh? Sergeant, come here, man. Take care. Free. Yeah. 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 I look like a complete joke. All these oh, months, hey. all this nonsense, oh, Kevin, oh, this stick it. Sanjay yelled at Kevin Nash and walked off, and they immediately cut away. Why? I, I, I don't know. And again, Sanjay, Black Machismo, and, 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 and Alex Shelley all just hanging out. Just hanging out. This is pointless. <laughs> then we had Team 3D versus Christian and Abyss for the tag titles. Long story short, Dudley's not Christian to the outside when he tried to run in and hit Abyss with the 3D for the clean pin. Clean, in fact, because he's turning heel or babyface. So all of the bad guys came out, and to cut to the chase, they cut is the operative word here, by the way. They beat the hell out of Abyss. He cut his head. He cut his arms. And by arms, I mean he, he put the blade on his shoulder, and he pulled straight down to his elbow on both arms. Nasty. They had close-ups of this giant gash. He was screaming in uh, terror, probably because of uh, how much blood he is actually losing in this. He ended up having to get 60 stitches. I would like to note that for this this uh, post-match beating, which was a hell of a beating, I might Oh, add, they, yeah, it was effective. It accomplished its goal. They aired about one minute of the really bloody stuff. 
So he basically got one stitch for each second that this was all on the air. I don't get it. In a million years, I would never, ever do this shit. But uh, There is something deeply wrong with that man. I will say this, though. I will say this. This better be his babyface turn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they've done this before. They've had many times where he's, he's uh, seemingly turned, beaten up a heel, and the next week he, he turns on somebody else, and it's like, okay, well, is he turned? No. Is he not? No. This better be it. Well, I made because the comment. Because you can't top this. After he did the barbed wire match with Sabu, I made the comment, he's going to have a big, thick, pink line running down his forearm for the rest of his life because of this match. I hope it was worth it. And it's still there. You can see it. So, yeah, now he slices open his arms, as you note, from shoulder to elbow, going right through his giant tattoo. <laughs> it's going to be plain as day. Loses all the blood, has to get stitches. God, I hope it's worth it. For one minute on impact. It was violent. It was brutal. It was gross. I will say this. It was memorable. It was memorable. Off an impact ends, and we were sitting here the next day going, what happened on impact? I remember this. This, this made an impact. This absolutely made an impact. TNA Impact. Speaking of the devil, Sting faced Kurt Angle. Welcome to TNA. First ever match between Sting and Kurt Angle for free on television in the opener. That's right. I'd like to know that when I predicted this match was going to go three minutes, I hadn't read the spoilers, okay? <laughs> I just used my brain. Right. You've yeah. watched TNA before. You know how they operate. I was, in fact, right. It went three minutes. With a disqualification. With a shitty DQ. Let me, um, let me pull up the ratings for this wretched program. Well, surely they must have done the high twos, I would think. Oh, no, afraid not. Oh. This show did a 1.02. Wasn't well, that what they always do? Yeah, 1.4 million viewers they did for this program. That's odd. 1.02. Why aren't they getting so many new viewers? Let me take a look at the quarter hours here for this program here. What do you think the big dream match between Kurt Angle and Sting did? Oh, it must have been at least a 1.5. It was a .97, in no. fact. Yeah. How can that be? Well, I they built it up for a week. And then the second quarter... What was in the second quarter? We'll, we'll go over the ratings as we as we run this down. So the, this first quarter got a .97. Sting and Kurt Angle. They had a match, and it in the DQ. There's nothing else to say. When some geeks ran in. And today screened, and I quote, I can't believe it, they've thrown this match out already. For the first time ever, two of the all-time greats are going to be, and the winner gets it out of that sacrifice. And guess what? It's now. Again, keep in mind, the winner of this matchup gets the world's title shot against... Christian Cage, and just as I was going to say his name, he comes running right by the broadcast table, along with the other members of Team Cage. There's Tomko, AJ Styles, and Big Papa Pump Scott Steiner, and the referee is called for the bell. I can't believe it. They've thrown this match out already. Why can't you believe this, Mike Tanae? Seriously. <laughs> Mike Tanae does not watch TNA. Guess not. So, Angle was stretched out during the break, stretched out, and, and Snake gave us a stern lecture. And Don West had been called away to take a phone call from Cornette. So, before I interviewed Christian and his crew, they were ranting about this and that and, and uh, the usual title bullshit. Everyone wants a shot. Christian doesn't want to give it to anybody. Hell of a crew. So, um, Don came up and he said, listen, Singh won the match at the pay-per-view, but the title shot will not be taking place at the next pay-per-view. It's going to take place tonight. And it's, uh, wait, what am I doing here? Oh, you're right. Yeah, that's right. I was, I was just confused by my notes. No DQs. Or it'll be, well, let me, let me start over, sorry. Don West came in and said, Sting versus Christian will be tonight for the title. And if any of Christian's guys run in, it will be a DQ. And you would lose the belt. And you would lose the belt. So then we had a uh, convoluted as all fuck clusterfuck, the Suicide Stampede. Yeah. This is why I hate TNA. <laughs> this is a great reason. They had a screen with rules. The rules were, winners move on to three-way X-title match against Saban at Sacrifice. You cannot tag in your own partner. It was like a wacky... <laughs> they can never just have a match. No, there were a bunch of teams, and the winning team 
Those two guys were going to be in a three-way with Saban. Right. But you couldn't tag your partner because I guess if he did something, I don't know. I have no idea why you cannot tag your partner because they ended up working with the partners anyway. I don't know. So, anyway. So, the only one introduced was Senshi. He comes out. Two men started to wrestle. There were six men in the apron, and I had no idea what the teams were. Yeah, they didn't even tell us the teams. I had to no go graphic? Th- no. I had to go through and figure them out. It was Alex Shelley and, and Kaz. Sharky and Low Key, Petey Williams and Jerry Lynn, and Sanjay Dutton and Jay Lee. What a team Sharky and Low Key are. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you. Hello, team. So, the finish saw Sanjay hit a move, but Lethal stole his pin. And Sanjay was mad, even though his partner, by stealing the win, had gotten him into a title match at the pay-per-view. Yes. And he was, he was angry at his partner and didn't want to be involved. That doesn't make any sense. I was like, well, why are you in the goddamn match then? I don't know. So Grandpa Nash came out to try and uh, try and calm things down. <laughs> didn't work, though. Sanji was still mad. This was so stupid. None of this made any sense, and I hated it all. Borash. Wait, that's not true. I must say, there was one point where Jerry Lynn snuck up behind somebody. And when I say snuck up, I mean on tiptoe with giant hand movements, and that was great. Everything else I hated. Jerry Borash was at a nuclear plant or something to interview or give us an update on Kurt Angle. There was green light on him and some flashing lights. Yeah. And a fence. I don't know. I don't know where the fuck this was. Sting walked in. He was mad. He didn't want to get his title shot this way, he said, but he'd take it. Hell of a baby face. <laughs> he didn't want to get it this way. I, I forgot to explain. The, the opener... The winner got the title shot at the pay-per-view. Now, perhaps you're saying, well, didn't Sting win it at the pay-per-view? Well, apparently, Angle had asked for a shot at the title shot. And since it was a DQ... Sting retained his title shot. Sting retained his title shot. I believe that's correct. They did a horrible (laughs) job explaining this. In fact, you had to explain it to me. You paused and had no idea what was going on, and I explained to you as best I could... And it fit, I, don't, I won't say it made sense, but it fit with what was going on on TV. Had you not been in the room, I would have no idea what was going on. So I was useful. You were. Excellent. By the way, that segment did a .95 rating. What did the opener do? A .97. I don't know if I'm surprised at that or not, actually. <laughs> then we had the big Robert Rude Tracy segment, which... Holy Christ. Okay, well, let me, let me start off with the good news. When Eric Young finally punched Robert Roode, the place went haywire. They went crazy. That's true. This worked in that sense. That said, everything else about it blew. All right. Robert Roode came out. He said seven days expired. They wanted to know who Eric's friend was. Again, why should we care that Eric Young has a friend? What difference has this made? None. Clearly none. He's still a slave. He's still a slave. Robert Roode, I don't know why Robert Roode needs to know who his friend is. The friend has done nothing for Eric Young, so why does Robert Roode care? Right. I I don't know why... don't know why, why Robert Roode is employing Eric Young. I, I it's gotten know, him nothing. Well, I, well that, that too. I don't know why Eric Young can't lie about his friend. I don't know why Eric can't make the name up. Phil. My friend is named Phil. My friend is named Phil. My name uh, Harry. My buddy Harry, he's been there for me during this this, he gives me pep talks. this time of slavery. I don't know why Eric Young can't quit Robert Roode Enterprises and just wrestle for TNA. Sure. <laughs> Apparently that's impossible. <laughs> it's against the laws of time and space. I, I don't know. So, Eric cut a promo about how he had a secret friend who had been there through thick and thin who had given him great advice, which both of us were trying to figure out what advice this could possibly be. <laughs> It has clearly done Eric Young no good, right? So, Rude said he just needed to know who the friend was. He began slapping him repeatedly. Eric punched him, fired up, that sort of thing. Tracy tried to interfere, so Eric gave her a power bomb, grabbing both breasts in his <laughs> move as he slammed her to the mat. Ten seconds later, she was back up again, no selling this power bomb. She gave him a low blow. Rude gave him a chair shot, and he gigged. They handcuffed him. Rude said he was going to waffle him if he did not reveal his friend. Eric did not just say, Larry. <laughs> he did not just spat out a name. He refused to, to, to tell the truth. So finally out came Jarrett, who uh, beat up Rude. 
gave Tracy the guitar shot. He creamed Miss Brooks, non-screamed, in the face. <laughs> he oh, creamed her in the face, was his exact words. Well, he had that in the face. We need that drop, by the way. <laughs> yes, we do. That's a, that's a whole song right there. In the face. That brings a, well, same meaning. <laughs> so <laughs> even more specific. Oh, he checked it He blocked it. He blocked a low blow attempt by Miss Brooks, and now he's going to turn it around on her. He just set her up. He baited her to do the same thing. Listen to the crowd. You know what they want. You know what the crowd wants you to do. Oh, yeah. Here comes the guitar. Get her, Jeff. Get her. Get her with that guitar. Just level her. She's helpless right there. Has he got it? Look at the look on Robert Roode's face. Oh, Oh, she's she's not even worth it. She's not even. Yes, she is. Turn around. Oh, he just creamed her. He just creamed Miss Brooks. So anyway, that was the whole thing, and then uh, and it was over. Now, I will say that Robert Roode was so awesome bumping for the baby faces. He gets a thumbs up. Sure. Tracy not selling, she gets a thumbs down. Yeah. The whole storyline in general, two thumbs oh, down. Oh, a whole fucking body down. The, the, the uh, crowd reaction, thumbs up. The rating, 1.04. You're kidding me. No. It actually hurts me that people cared about this. More people turned in for this. That doesn't surprise me at all, actually, because uh, it, was, it was a... It was a... It was the end-to-end angle? It was a soap opera that the people were into, and, and everyone played their roles well, even though it made right. no sense. I'm not surprised by the 1.04. You're actually glossing over a lot of the stupidity. I'll, I will try to catch up on what you missed. There was a lot to take in. Eric, at one point, actually said, You can fire me. I'm not going to tell you who my friend is. At which point, Bobby didn't just fire him. <laughs> In fact, he, he dared him to hit him or something. So then the fight breaks out. Eric Young is running wild. Now, <laughs> Tracy, no one ever puts their hands on Tracy. This, all, this girl broke Eric Young's heart. He gets his hand on her. He looks at the crowd. The crowd's going crazy. You don't give away the, the violence of the woman in the first angle. You save that. You build to it. You have Eric Young get his hands on her every week, but she always escapes. And two months down the road, he leaves her out. Nope, nope. Picks her up, ho- hoists her in the sky, feels her up and power bombs her. And this was nasty. He, he pissed her out there, and she landed funny with her arm behind her back, and it was it looked bad. Everyone went nuts, but who cares? It came out of nowhere. So then the fight breaks out more. As you said, Tracy Brooks is back up, low, low-blowing Eric. So <laughs> only at this point, when Eric is handcuffed and helpless and double-teamed, only at this point does Jeff Jarrett finally come out. What a shitty friend he turned out to be. <laughs> it took all this time. for he, He's such a good friend with Eric Young. He didn't want anyone to know he was Eric's friend. He was afraid of, of how uncool he would look to be hanging out with Eric Young. Wow, you're a pal. You're, you're a good friend, Jeff. And then, of course, he gets his hands on Tracy Brooks, and they did it again. They did the same stupid mistake twice in one segment, which even for TNA is saying quite a bit. So he, <laughs> he, her, he helps her up. He hoists his guitar up. People are going nuts. Don is screaming about creaming her in the face. He let her go. He teased it. And then he turned around and waffled her. And again, why? That's a, between the power bomb and the guitar shot, they could have about four to five months out of this. They got five minutes. Well, they got a 1.04. They only got a 1.04. Well, it worked then. My bad. I'm sorry. I take it all back, TNA. You know what you're doing. All just sit back and shut up. That's I'm right. just a geek on the Internet. My bad. Yep. 1.04. Good job. Good job, TNA. 1.04. Hate the show. I'm trying to figure out what that 1.4 got him. <laughs> well, they tuned in and watched the show and were not inspired. Certainly not any money. Uh, may- maybe the extra .4 will really, really want to see Bobby and Eric on the next pay-per-view. It yeah. was over announced. <laughs> there was no, they, they weren't told, but by the way, these men were wrestling in three weeks. They so. probably have a blindfold match, too. Or a chain match. And we had Team 3D and Steiner and Tomko, NWA tag titles. LAX ran in. Um, even though the opener ended in a DQ, this, uh, what happened? Actually, the opener and the main event ended in a DQ because of a run-in. And this had a run-in and no DQ. <laughs> because it's TNA! <laughs> so... Dudley's pinned Tomko with a combo neck breaker. They couldn't even do the three. No. No one Tomko pinned Samoa Joe. <laughs> and everyone's saying, well, d- d- don't worry. This is the start of, of making something big with Tomko. Yeah. This is the start of something big. Now, fuck yeah. He just pinned Joe and is now returned to jobber status. 
God, this company sucks. Christian versus Sting for the NWA title. Championship match on TV, eight minutes left, four of which was a commercial. And it's Jackie and Gale in the street fight next week, which I'm excited for. Sting hit the death drop. Christian kicked out. Yeah. It wasn't the heel hitting his finish and the baby face kicked out. <laughs> the baby face hit his finish and the heel kicked out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Kurt Angle No one's ever in. seen that before. Kurt Angle ran in for the DQ. What do you mean? The point I'm trying to make is why would you have the fucking heel kick out of the baby face's move? Well, uh, saying, saying that something's never been done before, it gives you things like the, the baby face is giving the advantage to War Games, for example. I see. Yes. So Angle beat up Christian for beating him up earlier. Sting got mad, so he hit him with his bat, that big angle. And this got a 0.95. So Eric Young and Bobby Dude are, in fact, more popular than Sting and Kurt Angle and Christian. This segment tied the lowest rating on the show, in fact. This world championship match... Between Kurt Angle, no, I'm sorry, between Christian and Sting for the NWA title, with a run-in by Kurt Angle, did the same rating as the X Division Suicide Suckfest. <laughs> no one, no one who was in it. <laughs> oh, God. I reminded of a quote Bobby Heenan once said about WCW, where he said, you can't really call this company a promotion, because they don't know how to promote. <laughs> TNA, everybody. TNA. Impact blows. <laughs> 